There's a new Netflix documentary on diets, and it's been the usual, very mixed reception, with some people celebrating it enthusiastically, and others shooting it down with a lot of vitriol in some cases. It's a four-episode show. It's called You Are What You Eat, and it's been one of the most watched shows on Netflix since it premiered. The show follows the Stanford Twin Experiment, which is a study we covered here recently where they took 22 pairs of identical twins and they assigned them randomly to either a vegan or an omnivore diets. In the show, we meet four of those pairs of twins that participated in the study and we follow their experience. We see the session where the twins got assigned to their respective diets and there is significant trepidation about being assigned to the vegan diet. One pair of twins are professional chefs that cook with a lot of animal products. Another pair are cheese experts and aficionados. So these are people whose normal day-to-day -day lives are very much non-vegan. Now, this type of show is usually heavy on the anecdotes and the personal stories. That's almost inevitable. The vast majority of viewers are going to connect much easier with anecdotes, with individuals, than with abstract data or bar graphs. This one, as TV shows go, actually goes back and forth between showing aspects of the study and other more personal anecdotal type episodes. In general, the show is pretty open about where its allegiances lie. They bring on several vegan advocates. We hear testimonials from people who put diseases in remission using vegan diets. They interview a Michelin star chef who turned his entire award-winning restaurant in a completely plant-based direction. They even feature the CEO of Impossible Foods and the founder of a brand of vegan cheese. I think it's fair to say it's not really a show about nutrition science per se. It's a show about vegan diets, about veganism, about plant-based diets perhaps. And the showmakers are pretty obviously excited, enthusiastic, about uh, vegan diets and are sort of extolling them through this show. Now, we hear a couple of common scientific claims in the section about cheese. We hear this idea that casomorphins are addictive and that this is why people struggle to give up cheese. I've heard this claim made a number of times from different vegan advocates, but I've never actually seen any scientific evidence for it. So I tried to look and I couldn't find much in terms of compelling evidence in humans. There are studies of casomorphins in lab animals like rats, for example, but I haven't seen anything showing an addictive property. One study even concluded milk products containing casomorphins are not likely to become the focus of addiction. So if the evidence is out there in human beings, I'm open to it. I haven't seen it yet. So at this point, I don't know if there's anything else to this than storytelling. Another claim we hear on the show that is also common out there is that substantial dairy intake can increase risk of prostate cancer. This is another one that's very common to hear. There is truth to it. There is a link between dairy intake and increased risk of prostate cancer. But what's almost never mentioned is that there's also a link between dairy intake and other types of cancer, specifically breast and colorectal, but in the opposite direction. So people who consume more dairy tend to have lower risk of those specific types of cancer. In fact, if you look at the guidelines from the American Cancer Society, there's no specific recommendation for dairy in either direction, recommending or discouraging, precisely because the data on cancer is mixed. So I'm not a big fan of this type of communication where you tell the public one side of the coin, you don't show them the rest. I'm not sure how this is empowering or how this helps people make educated decisions. Let me address real quick why I think this is so dangerous and so counterproductive. Because I know what the psychology is. I've heard this many times and I know we're going to get some comments below saying, hey, they're getting people to eat a healthier diet. Why do you have to attack these people? Why do you have to nitpick so much? First of all, it's really ethically dicey to try to get people to do something by 
selectively showing them facts or by stretching things and giving them inaccurate information. That's um, shady enough as is. But even if we leave all of that aside, this tactic backfires massively. When people realize that some of the information is inaccurate or incomplete, kind of selective, they just dismiss the whole thing. Most people don't have the time to go investigate each topic in detail. That's why they're watching a documentary. So they're going to lump everything together. And can you blame them? I don't. So they hear about the Stanford randomized trial with twins. Oh, that was in the same show that also made those exaggerated, unreliable claims about dairy. So maybe that's all bunk. Oh, that same show also brought up uh, climate change. So maybe that's entirely a hoax, right? It taints everything. It's like it's radioactive. And lastly, I'm almost done with this rant, okay? Everybody else is going to use the same playbook to sell every diet on the internet, every supplement, every wellness fad, things that you're going to find are really dangerous and really questionable, but you're not going to have any moral authority to criticize if you supported the same tactic when it was applied to the diet that you happen to like. So the only path is to point this out when it's done, regardless of which diet is being talked about or which influencer, if we like the person or not, statements are either backed by the evidence, they either reflect balance of evidence or they don't. If they don't, it's not the end of the world, but we improve, right? We make things more accurate. And that goes for everybody. It goes for me as well. Okay, end of the rant, back to the show. On a positive note, the show features many important issues around food beyond just the aspect of nutrition, like contamination issues in factory farms, widespread antibiotic use and the consequences of that, and also the climate impact, which I agree is hugely important to learn about. I'm not a climate scientist, that's not my training, but I do try to read up on this topic as much as I can. And I try to talk to people who do it professionally. We have a couple of videos previously on this topic, and it does look like there is compelling evidence that the way we produce foods, the food system needs to change if we are to get climate emissions under control. It's absolutely about fossil fuels. That's a huge part of the puzzle, but it's also about how we produce our foods. And actually these two sectors overlap. So it's about all of it. The show also features some great social efforts like organizations trying to fight food deserts by growing and providing fresh vegetables for underprivileged communities. One really interesting thing about the show is they go over a lot of different experiments that were carried out in the Stanford study. And it looks like that publication that we featured recently in a previous video is just the beginning. There's a lot of interesting experiments that haven't been published yet, and I'm sure will come out in the future. So for example, the effect of the two diets on the microbiome, on cognitive function, so brain function, on the rate of aging, and also on body composition, including visceral fat. They do mention some of the flashier results on the show, so we're gonna touch on that briefly. So spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the show yet, we are gonna spill the beans a little bit here. Of course, in order to properly evaluate this, we're gonna have to wait until things are peer reviewed and published so we can actually go through methodology and results. That's absolutely essential. Anything that's mentioned on a TV show in passing, we have to use a huge grain of salt. So in terms of body composition, this ratio of fat lost to muscle gained, it looks from the show like at least in some twins, this ratio was more favorable on the omnivore diets. So it'll be interesting to see if that pans out in the actual full set when it's published. And also I imagine this will hinge on the details. How much resistance training was each person doing? Protein intake, as we saw in the video previously, the vegans in average were getting less protein and substantially less. So that's an obvious thing to bear in mind when we're talking about body composition. They also had a more novel, a more original experiment in there and that honestly seemed tailor-made for a Netflix show. They had the participants watch porn and as they were doing it, they took pictures of their genitals, 
I am not kidding. They actually did this, and they used those pictures to assess the temperature of their nether regions. So they're kind of gauging the blood flow to those zones. So it's a measure of arousal, really. Now, it looked like only the female participants went through this specific experiment. There's probably a, a technical limitation where you can't tell temperature differences in males, maybe. Or maybe the males are always aroused, so you can't tell the difference. All right, it's been real, everybody. I think I'm getting canceled. It looked like all of the females improved. There was more blood flow after the experiment, after the two months. The investigators suggest that this is because they were all exercising. That's certainly possible. Also, they were all on diets that are pretty clean, probably better than the diets they were on before the trial. So that's another possible explanation. And it looked like the twins on the vegan diets improved even more. Now, they only showed two pairs of twins, so we really can't make anything of it. But it'll be interesting to look at the published results, see if anything pans out. In terms of cognitive function, they had the twins go through some tests, some puzzles, some memory tests, things like that. And they did not detect a statistically significant difference between the two diets by the end of the study. The researchers suggest that this might be because the participants are pretty young and cognitively normal. They look like they're mostly in their 30s and 40s. So maybe if you look at an older population that's starting to decline a little bit cognitively, maybe you'll pick up something. And then in terms of the microbiome, they did detect significant differences. I think that's more expected. We know the microbiome can change rapidly with diet. So for example, the twins on the vegan diets had more bifidobacteria in their microbiomes. Generally, in the microbiome literature, bifidobacteria are seen as health-promoting bacteria. But in this concrete case, does this margin, this difference that they detect, uh, result in any actual health improvements, any health advantage. TBD, we'll see again. We'll also look at the published data. And then these experiments on the biological clock. This has been one of the most touted results of the study. So they actually measured the telomeres of the participants. So telomeres are the caps, kind of the ends of chromosomes. And in general, as we age, telomeres get shorter. So they use this as a surrogate of the rate of aging. And they did observe a statistically significant difference. The vegans had longer telomeres by the end of the experiment. Pretty curious finding, a little surprising, because it's something that we tend to think about as a more long-term parameter. But interesting, it'll be interesting to see also what if any health implication this has. And I also wonder if this does pan out, what is it about that group that elicits this difference? Is it really something about the vegan diet per se? Is it the weight loss, as we saw in the previous video, the twins on the vegan diet lost more weight? Or is it something else altogether? And then other metrics like LDL cholesterol and fasting insulin, those were lower in the vegans. And we covered that in the previous video. In general, when I'm watching a movie or a TV show, even if it's uh, based on true events, movie or reality show, I'm always aware that it's fundamentally entertainment. It's fine to watch, it's fun to watch, but it's good not to forget it needs to be captivating for a general audience. It needs to have a storyline. It needs to have a beginning, a middle and an end and kind of wrap nicely. So at the end of the day, there is no substitute for looking directly at scientific data. And we covered the published results of the Stanford twin experiment in a recent video, and I'll link that right here. And I also reviewed another Netflix show on diets called The Game Changers a few years ago, actually, and I'll link that right there. Check those out. I'll see you next time.